In addition to praying the rosary on the five first Saturdays of the month and making the communion of reparation, Our Lady has asked us to keep her company for 15 minutes, meditating upon one of the mysteries contained in her holy rosary. Today we join her in contemplating the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. Our Blessed Mother Mary was very keen for her son to be present at the wedding feast. We are told by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich that our Lord had undertook to supply one course of the feast and that Our Lady went to Cana before the other guests and helped in various preparations. Our Lord, in fact, had engaged to supply the wine for the feast. Wherefore it was that Our Lady so anxiously reminded him that the wine had failed. Our Lord and his Holy Mother spoke and conversed with those who came to the wedding, but always with a wisdom and gravity worthy of themselves and with the view of enlightening the hearts of all that were present. Thus teaches Venerable Mary of Agrida. Our Lady spoke very few words, and only when she was asked or when it was necessary. She listened and attended without interruption to the doings and sayings of our Lord. She treasured them. She meditated upon them in her most pure heart. What an example for all of us, both religious and lay. Our Lady, present at the wedding feast, wore a modest garment, and upon this modest garment she held the charm of silence and restraint, means by which so many vices are shut out, and by which virtue and chastity more fittingly shine forth. At the table, our Lord and his Holy Mother ate some of the food, but with greatest moderation, yet also without showing outwardly their great abstinence. Although when they were alone, we're told by Menbo Mary, they didn't eat such food. They decide, desired, as teachers of perfection, to show a life that was not singular. And so on the occasion of the wedding feast, they participated, they participated joyfully, taking the food that was present there. As our Lord will later tell the Apostles, eat what is set before you. Indeed, the truly poor and humble do not presume to have a choice in their food. Our Lord comes with his disciples to the marriage, teaches Saint Cyril of Alexandria. The disciples had to be present with the wonder worker so that they might collect the deeds he accomplished as a kind of food to their, to their faith. When the wine ran out at the feast, his mother called the Lord whom she knew to be the good Lord and the man filled with love for men. And so she said, they have no wine. Our Lady knew that it was in his power to do whatsoever he wanted. And so she urges him to the miracle. Thus speaks Saint Cyril of Alexandria. We're told in the fifth century Coptic fragments the following. When the wine ran out at the wedding, Mary was assured that Jesus would not grieve her in anything that she might ask of him, and so she approached the place whereon her son was reclining with utmost reverence. The Virgin said, My son, my beloved, the one whom my soul desires, my Lord and my God, I beg you to manifest your power as Son of God. 
Let all the nations know you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, for my son. They have no wine. And Jesus said to his mother in a kindly voice, Woman, what do you wish of me? My hour is not yet come. But his mother, being assured that he would not grieve her in anything, spoke to the ones who were serving and said, Whatever he says to you, do it. St. Alphonsus, reflecting on this, says, Persuaded by the prayers of his mother, the Lord gives. Jesus cannot but graciously hear Mary in all her petitions, wishing in this, as it were, to obey her as his true mother. He also grants her petitions in order to thank her, inasmuch as she gave to him of herself a true human nature. The prayers of Mary, therefore, have a certain authority with Jesus Christ, and so she obtains pardon even for the greatest sinners when they commend themselves to her. Venerable Anne Catherine Emmerich informs us that Our Lady's words to Jesus were uttered in a low voice. They have no wine. But our Lord's reply, as well as his command to draw water, was given in a loud voice so that everyone in the vicinity might hear his words. Returning to the Coptic fragments, under the Lord's instruction, they hastened and filled the water jars with water, and they brought them to Jesus, who made the sign of the cross over the water jars. And immediately the water was transformed into excellent wine. What a wonder! We see here in this fragment the link between the cross and the miracle of Cana. Our Lord says his hour had not yet come. That hour was the hour of the cross. And by performing this miracle, by tracing the cross over the water, he hastens towards the cross. St. Alphonsus reflects, The tenderness of Mary's mercy is made manifest at Cana. The wine fails. The spouses are troubled. No one speaks to Mary to ask her son to console them in their necessity. But the tenderness of Mary's heart, which cannot but pity the afflicted, moved her to take the office of advocate and without being asked to entreat her son to work a miracle. Unasked, she assumed the office of an advocate and a compassionate helper. If unasked, if unasked, this good lady has done so much, what will she not do for those who invoke her intercession? Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich tells us of the discovery. Then the bridegroom and the bride's father drank of the wine, and great was their astonishment. The servants protested that they had drawn only water, and that the drinking vessels and glasses on the table had been filled with the same. And now the whole company drank of it. The miracle gave rise to no alarm or excitement. On the contrary, a spirit of silent awe and reverence fell upon them. Jesus then taught much upon this miracle. She continues, his disciples, his relatives, in a word, all present, were now convinced of Jesus' power and dignity, as well as of his mission. All believed in him. Faith at once took possession of every heart. All became better, more united, more interior. The same effect was produced in all that are drunk of the wine. O oh Lord Jesus, let me taste of that wine interiorly as they did.
that I might become holier, better, more interior. Blessed Anne Catherine continues, At the close of the banquet, the bridegroom went to Jesus and spoke to him very humbly in private. He told him that he now felt himself dead to all carnal desires and that, if his bride would consent, he would embrace a life of continence. The bride also, having sought Jesus alone and expressed her wish to the same effect, Jesus called them both before him. He spoke to them of marriage, of chastity so pleasing in the sight of God, and of the hundredfold fruit of the Spirit. He referred to many of the prophets and other holy persons who had lived in chastity, offering their bodies as a holocaust to the Heavenly Father. Thus they had reclaimed many wandering souls, had won them and had won to themselves as many, many spiritual children, and had acquired through chastity a numerous and holy posterity. What a wonder! We never or rarely contemplate of chastity as a fruit of this wedding feast of Cana, a miraculous desire to become an apostle of our Lord. Because indeed, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich tells us that this bridegroom became one of the intimate followers, and the bride, she joined Our Lady's company. This is a teaching that we find in St. Maximus the Confessor, who tells us, but the water's change into wine also affected a change in the one who was the host. The bridegroom left the wedding in his home, and he followed and served the excellent guest, the gracious Lord and King, and the bridegroom of immaculate and holy souls. So also the bride served the all-holy mother of the Lord, so that the miracle done by the Lord not only turned water into wine, but it also changed marriage into virginity. What of us? Let us think of how we relate to this wondrous miracle. The Virgin said one day to Saint Bridget that the miserable, that miserable and miserable for eternity shall be the sinner who though it, he has it in his power during this life to come to her who is able and willing to assist him neglects to invoke her aid and is lost. We are told by Saint Peter the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But Our Lady, Saint Alphonsus tells us, goes about in search of sinners to save them. The Queen of Clemency presents our petitions and begins to assist us before we even ask the assistance of her prayers. Oh, may Cana give me great encouragement. Mary's heart is so full of tenderness towards us that she cannot behold our miseries without affording relief. Let us then, in all our wants, be most careful to have recourse to this Mother of Mercy who is always ready to assist those who invoke her aid. She is always prepared to come to our help and frequently anticipates our supplications. But ordinarily, she requires that we should pray to her and is offended when we neglect to ask her assistance. O oh, Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Cana, see my present misery. I lay before you the needs both temporal and spiritual of myself and my family. I come before you as those servants needing wine. I trust that you, my mother, will gain the graces from your son, who in a certain manner can be said to be indebted to you, who has given him a human nature. Blessed Virgin, help me 
as you did at Cana, to enjoy the good things in life, to rejoice in the occasions of wedding, to be seen in the eyes of men as someone who does not stand out for penance, while secretly and known only to God, I live a life of mortification, of simplicity, of penance. Blessed Mother, always near your son, always speaking to him. Help me to have that attitude, referring everything back to him, even the small things. Mother, give me a heart like yours. Intercede for me. Pray for me.